Good afternoon, and welcome to the second event of our 2021 Power of Arts and Sciences Week. Our school is the heart and soul of Washington University. The teaching and scholarship within arts and sciences impact lives far beyond our campus. And this series is a celebration of that. I am so pleased that you have joined us today. This year, our Power of Arts and Sciences events are inspired by our new strategic plan, which was made public yesterday. In the plan, we define an exciting shared vision for the next 10 years, a time that is sure to go down in Washu history as the decade of arts and sciences. Our strategic plan is meant to motivate and create and move us forward and to bolster the education we offer and the scholarship we produce. I hope you will take a moment to look through it. I'm sure you will be inspired by our vision for the years ahead. One of the priorities we have named in our strategic plan is connecting the work we do and the discoveries we make with our community and society. Today's event is a perfect example of that. You're getting a backstage pass to the Tolman Group Laboratory. You will hear how their innovative research on inorganic molecules has significant impacts on both healthcare and environmental sustainability. The research group is led by Bill Thoman, the William Greenleaf Edit Professor of Chemistry, Editor-in-Chief of the Journal in Organic Chemistry, and Vice Dean of Research and Entrepreneurship in Arts and Sciences. His team has published more than 200 papers in peer-reviewed journals. In his role as Vice Dean, Bill helps us to elevate the research enterprise of arts and sciences and support faculty in their research efforts, scholarship, and creative practice. Please join me in welcoming Dr. William Tolman. Thank you, Dean Hu. Um, I now have the pleasure of giving you a behind the scenes peek into our research lab, and you'll get a chance to meet members of our team of students and postdoctoral scholars who are joining me on the panel today. So we've divided this recorded lab tour into shorter clips for today's presentation, and here is the first clip. Hello, my name is Bill Tolman, and I am the William Greenleaf Elliott Professor of Chemistry at Washington University in St. Louis. In addition, I'm the Vice Dean of Research and Entrepreneurship in Arts and Sciences, Editor-in-Chief of the American Chemical Society Journal, Inorganic Chemistry, and Faculty Fellow in the Wayman Crow Residential College. After 27 years at the University of Minnesota, I wanted to come to WashU in large part because of its stellar undergraduate programs and the liberal arts ethos, but also because I saw an opportunity to upgrade my research program. The top-notch space in Bryan Hall has been critical for us, as it provides a modern, safe, and wonderfully seamless open laboratory configuration, perfect for the kind of multidisciplinary research that we do. Today, I wanna to give you a backstage pass to our lab. We work in two research areas in the Center for Sustainable Polymers, which is supported by the National Science Foundation, we're trying to understand the detailed chemical mechanisms involved in the catalytic conversion of chemicals derived from plants into plastics that have useful properties and are biodegradable and renewable. These plant-based alternatives to petroleum-derived plastics offer possible solutions to major pollution problems. The knowledge we glean from our studies is helping us and others to design better catalysts to make better sustainable plastics. In a second project, supported by the National Institutes of Health, we prepare, characterize, and study the reactivity of copper complexes that model key proposed intermediates involved in important biological processes 
performed by copper-containing enzymes. For example, one such enzyme is critical for the synthesis of neuronal hormones in the brain, and we're gaining insight into how this critical reaction works. Such knowledge may inform efforts to develop therapeutics that target this enzyme. In essence, we study inorganic molecules in exquisite detail with the aim of understanding how they react to make sustainable polymers and how key copper species react in biology. Now I'd like to take you into my lab and introduce you to a few students who will explain some of our equipment and processes. So we're here now in our laser room and I'm here with Caitlin Boucher, a graduate student of my group. Caitlin, uh, tell us a little bit about what you do in here. Yeah, so in here we take frozen samples of very reactive complexes and we put them into our low temperature uh, sample holder here and then we take lasers and shine it at this system of mirrors, which eventually will hit our sample here, and our sample will scatter light, and it's then collected into our spectrometer over here, and then that light that it's scattered will tell us a little bit of information about the chemical bonds that we have in our reactive samples. So the purpose here of doing all these experiments is then to characterize in real detail the bonding between the atoms involved in our complexes. Correct. We, yes. We get all, all the information about certain bonds that we can't see by other techniques with this technique. Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin. Yes. Thank you, Bill. Great, so um, it's my pleasure to introduce Caitlin to all of you. Um, Caitlin, welcome. So Caitlin, maybe just real quickly, tell us what's your story? How did you end up working in my group? Yeah, hi, Bill. So I started off with my undergraduate studies at Michigan State University, and I worked in a chemistry lab there. And that is when I decided I wanted to go to graduate school. And so I um, started at the University of Minnesota, ended up joining your group because I really enjoyed bioinorganic chemistry, learning all of the synthetic techniques as long, um, along with all of the spectroscopic techniques that come along with it. Um, and then ended up coming to WashU with you because I thought it would be a great opportunity to um, help build a lab with you. Great, um, and maybe you can take a moment and tell us a few specifics about one of your research projects. Yeah, so I work on the copper oxygen um, side of your group. And so we have oxygen gas all around us. Um, so that comes in uh, O2 um, dioxygen. And uh, nature and enzymes have evolved to be able to use O2 to do various processes um, and to gain energy. Like for example, in our mitochondria, there is um, this enzyme, cytochrome C oxidase. And cytochrome C oxidase has copper um, sites inside of it that can use the oxygen and um, make water from it. And now how that process exactly happens isn't exactly known. And so what we do in our lab is to try to take commercially available chemicals that we can then synthesize um, discrete molecules to be able to capture the oxygen and understand what kind of state it is in, like um, if it still has the double bond between the two oxygens or what the bonds are in, betwe in between the two oxygens are. And one way we can do that is with the laser lab that you just saw, where we can shine the light on it and really understand exactly how those two oxygen molecules are interacting with each other. And that ended up leading us to publish um, an article recently in the Journal of Inorganic Biochemistry. Thank you, Caitlin, that's a great introduction. Um, let's turn now to our next little video featuring a postdoctoral researcher in, in my lab who works in the sustainable polymer area. So I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Evan Beaumier. Doc, uh, Evan is a postdoctoral associate in my laboratory. Evan, tell us a little bit about what you do. Yeah, so my research focuses on uh, designing uh, very earth abundant metal catalysts for the polymerization of plant-based monomers. Cool, and so are you gonna show us a little something about how you do this? Yeah, I thought I would show you uh, how I uh, synthesize some of these catalysts um, here on the bench top. So what I have here 
um, is a ligand, which is essentially just an organic molecule that we're going to want to put on a transition metal or main group metal. And here we will now add our metal. And you can see by this color change that this reaction is proceeding. So Evan, this particular synthesis is done out in the air, but oftentimes that's not the case for a lot of the things we work with, right? That is correct. So uh, typically our catalysts are air and moisture sensitive, and so it's crucial that we will be, be able to do these synthetic uh, procedures in an inert atmosphere. Thank you, Evan, for all the hard work you do and for explaining that a little bit to us. It's been great. Thanks, Bill. So Evan recently left the group to take a position as advanced research chemist in the process chemistry lab at Eastman Chemical Company. So Evan, what's your story? What were your experiences leading to your time in my group as a postdoc and to your current position at Eastman? Uh, yeah, similarly to Caitlin, I also began my undergraduate studies at Michigan State University. Um, that was where I first really got interested in the synthesis of uh, metal containing uh, molecules, which I just found to be a lot of fun. Um, and so from there, I pursued my uh, doctoral studies at the University of Minnesota, working for Professor uh, Ian Tonks. Uh, and there we were using um, some highly earth abundant metals, such as titanium, for some more organic uh, reactions. Uh, but uh, that led me to, to then uh, work as a postdoctoral researcher with you in your lab. And, you know, how have your experiences as a postdoc prepared you for your current job? Um, yeah, that's a very good question. So um, I found uh, working as a postdoc in your lab, it, it really gave me, uh, uh, on one hand, a lot of opportunity for, for mentorship uh, with a lot of members of your group. But in addition, um, although all of your projects kind of revolve around uh, some transition metal ion performing some form of, you know, interesting chemistry, um, between sort of modeling enzymes and uh, polymerizing uh, Earth abundant monomers, these are very, very different uh, types of chemistry, uh, which I think helps kind of develop uh, some knowledge base for working in industry where your projects very well might not work, uh, be particularly well related. So, uh. thanks, Evan. I'm so glad to see you in your, in your new job. So, let's turn now to a short video with graduate student Abby Peterson. So let me introduce you to Appy Peterson. Uh, Appy, you have an interesting story about how you got interested in chemistry and came to graduate school. Why don't yeah. you tell us? Yeah, um, so I went to my undergraduate school at uh, University of Missouri, Kansas City, where I studied dance performance and chemistry. And so I was a professional ballet dancer for, for a while. And then I came back to chemistry and I was very fortunate to come to work here. Uh, I'm from St. Louis, and so I was very excited to get into the chemistry department graduate school here. Terrific. Um, yeah. Terrific. Well, we're glad to have you here, yeah. Happy. Um, and so tell us a little bit about this piece of equipment and why we need this giant box. What's oh. this box for? This is, to me, the most important thing that I, that I work with on a daily basis. This is our glove box, uh, and we have three of them in the lab. This is where I do air sensitive and moisture sensitive chemistry. So all the catalysts that we work with, all the polymerizations that I set up, um, anything that's air sensitive or moisture sensitive has to be done in here. So they're filled with nitrogen, not with air. And we have a big chamber and a small chamber so we can take in or take out um, anything that we need for our chemistry, but all has to go under vacuum for several cycles first. There's a big long process <laughs> for yes, going in is. and out. Yes, yeah. there is. You well, why don't you show ahead. us what it's like to work in there? Absolutely. So we have a balance and we have a stir plate where we can set up our reactions. We have all of our chemicals that we need to do air sensitive and moisture sensitive chemistry. And these have to be in here because if they're outside the box, they, um, they can ignite. <laughs> so they have to be in under nitrogen to be dealt with safely. And then, Appy, another really interesting thing that we, we had specially designed for us when we started our labs here in WashU is that right up there you see some valves. What's, what are those? These are amazing. So these are connected to the solvent system. So we get them piped through the ceiling all the way into the box here. So we don't have to bring in or out solvents. We can just unscrew the tap here and then get whatever solvent we need. Extremely helpful. Saves a ton of time. That's great. Thank you, Appy. Thank you. 
So Abby, we heard in the video a little bit about the story of how you came to be in the group. So maybe a question that I would ask you is, what's it like to work in the group? And you know, what does a typical day in the lab look like for you? Sure. Yeah, so a typical day starts with um, a strong cup of Turkish coffee that Yanai makes. So we're very grateful for that. That kind of kickstarts the day. Um, and then we go into lab, which is full of researchers from, you know, all the way undergraduates to graduate students like me to postdocs like Yanai and Evan. Uh, and we all have our own kind of responsibilities in the lab to kind of keep everything running smoothly. Um, so we check on our instruments, we check on the tank levels, um, just to make sure that everything is, is going all right so that we can all keep doing our chemistry. Uh, you saw me working in the glove box and I, I do work in the glove box a lot. So I, I check on the oxygen levels in there and make sure everything is going well. Um, and then I'll start to look through experiments that I had set up the day before, crystallizations that I had set up the day before, see if I have any crystals, um, and then kind of go from there. Uh, depending on the day, there might be a seminar that we can attend from like visiting lecturers um, or a group meeting where we can share our research and get everyone in the group's perspective on our recent results. Uh, set up more experiments, <laughs> that's the day. Thank you. So real briefly, what is the aim of your research and how are you trying to address that aim? Yeah, so I, I work in the Center for Sustainable Polymers, and one of the key um, problems that we're trying to solve is how to make plastics that are plant-based that are good enough to replace the ones uh, that are fossil fuel-based. So we have to really tune the properties of the plastics. And my, my research is to develop catalysts that can make those properties like tough or stretchy or able to withstand wide temperature ranges. So I'll tune little things about the catalyst. I'll change like a backbone or I'll change like a little chemical moiety on it. Um, for example, if we have some catalysts where if I change um, something called an indole, if I change the connection to a different position, it'll make the polymerization faster. And so just monitoring things like that and how, how we can make better catalysts to make these plant-based polymers. Thank you, Abby. Um, Appy has just finished writing her PhD thesis, which she will be defending in a few weeks, and I'm very happy that she's secured an exciting position as a postdoctoral research associate at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory starting in January. So let's now turn to a short video with another postdoctoral research associate in my lab who's work also working in the sustainable polymers area. This is Dr. Yanai Papowski. Uh, Yanai, tell us where you're from and, and what this piece of equipment is. So I'm from Israel. I was uh, very delighted with the opportunity to come here to Wash U and pursue uh, polymer chemistry, which was also what I did in Israel. Uh, the opportunity to work here with a bunch of talented people and state-of-the-art equipment was very appealing to me. And yeah, this is uh, an autocon. So during our research, we have to purify organic molecules. Those, those could be part of our catalyst all the building blocks that we use to uh, make polymers. And the autocon is one way of uh, purifying those materials. The way we do it is assemble a column into this instrument here. And by doing so, we can then purify the molecule of desire from everything else that we have in the solution. And then I can set up this instrument in order to perform the separation. And what's really cool about this is it's, it's all automated. And so these kinds of separations are typically done by people running glass columns. Very, you know, it's a very slow, arduous process, but this is all automated. That's very true. So that's typically a tedious process that would take me two to three hours on a large right. scale, right? And in this case, I can set up everything and everything occurs on its own. I don't even have to be here. I can do other things at the same time, and that makes the research go just faster. Yeah, much more efficient way of doing research. Much more efficient, yeah. of course. Well, thank you very much, Yanai. This is great. Thank Appreciate you, your help. Thank you so much. So welcome to Yanai. I'm glad to have you here. Um, maybe briefly tell us, what in your research are you most excited about, Yanai? Well, uh, a lot of things, um, but I would say that recently, um, in my project, I found some very interesting relationships between the structures of the copolymers that we're working with and their thermal and physical properties. This is a project that I'm uh, pursuing alongside, uh, in the collaboration, I would say, 
uh, with a very good group in uh, at Cornell University, the Codes Group. They have very good characterization skills of those copolymers, whereas I have the synthetic skills. And that has been a fruitful collaboration so far. We are about to write a paper on it, or in the process of writing even, and we even start thinking about the next step, which will be designing some catalysts that will allow us to target specific structures of those uh, copolymers. So for me, that's extremely exciting. That's great. And wh why did you choose to join our group? A lot of reasons, to be honest. Um, when the opportunity presented itself, so as you heard in the video, I um, came from Israel. I earned my PhD with Professor Cole at Tel Aviv University working on polymerization reactions. Um, so the opportunity to keep pursuing my scientific endeavor here in the Tolman Group was uh, amazing. Working with very talented people and uh, state-of-the-art equipment, of course, and also joining the NSF Center for um, Sustainable Polymers, which allows me to interact with scientists from other universities. I have a lot of uh, fruitful collaborations stemming from that and you know all of this uh, contributed to my decision to join the group. That's great. Well, thank you, Yanai. Um, Yanai has played a key leadership role in the group, helping to train folks and providing intellectual insights into many of our projects, for which I'm really grateful. Finally, we have a short video featuring a graduate student, uh, Laura Braver Braverman, who works in our bioinorganic chemistry area using a uniquely outfitted UV visible spectrophotometer. I'm with Lara Braverman. Lara is a graduate student in the group. Hi, Lara. Hello. Um, tell us a little bit about what this piece of equipment is for. Sure. Uh, so this piece of equipment allows us to um, look at molecules at low temperatures. Um, so it's really important uh, for what we do studying copper enzymes or compounds related to copper enzymes. And it's a quite a specialized piece of equipment because of that low temperature setup, isn't it? Yes. So right now, this experiment I have at negative uh, 60, which is really, really cold, because these compounds um, aren't stable at room temperature. So without something like this, we really wouldn't be able to learn very much about these compounds. Perfect. Thank you, Lara. So Lara, what led you to come to Wash U for graduate school? Sure. Um, so. I guess starting with why I chose to study chemistry, um, I always kind of knew that I wanted to study some kind of science, but I just had a fantastic um, teacher my freshman year of high school in chemistry that kind of showed me that this was what I really wanted to do. Um, so then I studied chemistry at Knox College um, and I was able to do some undergraduate research there. Um, and from there, I came here to Wash U. That's terrific. And what's your project all about? Sure. Um, so the first project that I worked on in lab um, was focused on making compounds called copper superoxides, which are a type of copper oxygen species. Um, and we know that these form in enzymes that are able to help break down cellulose into um, smaller components that are useful in applications such as biofuels. Um, so the only way that I was able to um, study these compounds and learn more about them was by using that instrument that we showed in the video, um, which is able to hold them at really low temperatures. Um, so we can watch reactions between these compounds and other compounds um, to learn more about them. Um, and then kind of moving into what I'm currently working on, um, using the same uh, framework that has been developed in this lab to study copper oxygen species, I'm using that to try to make iron oxygen species, which is particularly interesting um, because why we see this particular framework in um, several copper oxygen enzymes, but even though there's a ton of enzymes that contain iron oxygen species, none of them seem to use the same framework. Um, so I'm hoping to figure out why that is and um, whether these compounds using that framework could be useful. Well, thank you, Lara, for that introduction to your work. Um, so what we're going to do now is I'm going to open the discussion with the entire group of researchers and um, ask them a few general questions. I see that there are some questions coming in from the Q&A, which is terrific. And I promise I will get to those as we move along here in just a minute, in a minute. So welcome everyone. It's really great to have you here. Um, this group of students and postdocs is a really important group of people for me. They're, they're the ones who run the lab and, and do all the experiments. And I think it would be really interesting for our audience to hear your perspectives on a fundamental underlying question about the work that we do is which is 
which is this, why do we do what we do? Um, does anybody want to tackle that big question? Why is it that we do this? Jump in, please. Caitlin. Yeah, so one reason why we do our work is to, um, you know, help advance the field in a fundamental way that can possibly be used in a more broad, um, you know, setting in the future, especially like this, the polymer synthesis side of the group, they, you know, are making catalysts that could really improve the process one day on a, a like a, you know, a chemical industry scale, something like that. So uh, fundamental chemistry is going to be really helpful to that, you know, to um, advance possibly like industrial chemistry someday too. Um, I'm going to add along those lines, it's kind of the same thing, but um, the opportunity to perform fundamental basic chemistry, you know, on one hand, and being on the cutting edge of science, but incorporating it with real life issues, like the need to replace those fossil fuel based plastics, which are non degradable and pollute our environment is an amazing thing, you know, and really a benefit of working in a group like ours. So, you know, that's also uh, an answer to your question. That's terrific. We have we have a couple of questions that have come into the Q and A. Um, some of them are to, sort of for me, and maybe I'll I'll address one of those. One question is, um, you know, how many undergraduates do you typically have working in your lab each year? And another person asked, you know, what opportunities are there for undergraduate researchers? Um, I will say that there's lots of opportunities for undergraduate researchers. And in fact, this team of graduate students and postdocs plays a really important role in teaching those undergraduates about what it's like to work in the lab. Um, maybe one of you would like to talk about that experience for just a minute. What, what's it like to have an undergraduate come in the lab and work with you? Appy, do you wanna give that a shot? Sure, I, I've had a couple actually. Um, it, it's a really rewarding experience because you really have to get back to basics. Uh, I think as graduate students and postdocs, we're used to going really, really quickly. Um, and so it's really helpful for me to slow down and, you know, answer these questions about like, well, why is that? And no, how do you know that? And, you know, when you teach, you, you learn, you realize that you have to like, you see the holes in your understanding, you know, or that you can't explain it as well as you thought that you could. So it teaches you more about the science, but by having to like teach it to somebody else. And it's a really rewarding experience to watch someone get it and like start to go faster and start to like develop their own ideas and their own questions. And it's, it's really rewarding. Yeah. I, I think that's really fun to see also is when those undergraduates begin to see what real science is like, because, you know, in their courses, it's very textbook, you know, there's things that we've known for decades that they're learning about, but to go in the lab and actually touch a molecule that's never been made by someone else before for the first time is um, really exciting, I think. And I think a lot of undergraduates really, really love that. And so we, we constantly are attracting undergraduates to work in the lab through the Office of Undergraduate Research, but also through other avenues, including classes that I teach and other interactions as well. Um, another question came in and uh, the question is more for the sustainable polymer folks, which is, um, are there particular plants or types of plants that are most promising as a basis for developing plant-based plastics? Would you like to address that one, anyone? Uh, I'll speak for, for my research. Um, the monomers that I work with, the building blocks for the polymers can be derived from any carbohydrate containing plants. So beets, corn, um, that kind of stuff. It's uh, widely applicable uh, for, for my for my research, at least. Yeah, I'll add on. I'll, I'll just say that that's, that's absolutely the case. The idea is to use chemical feedstocks that are widely available so that we're not tied to any one particular agricultural product, um, okay. which could cause political, economical, and governmental issues down the, down the road. Um, let, let me ask another general question. To, to everyone in the, in, the, in the panel, what's your favorite or most rewarding thing to do in the lab other than drinking Yanai's Turkish coffee, which I know is a real pleasure for all of you. 
What's your favorite thing to do? So one of our techniques that we use in our lab is called x-ray crystallography. And so how that works is we take a compound that we purposely made, and then we try to put it under different conditions to um, grow single crystals. And a single crystal is where the compound is in a repeating unit over and over in these long three-dimensional space. And then we can take that crystal and hit it with x-rays. And those x-rays will allow us to see the bonds in every single molecule and, and you know, chemical element that's in that um, crystal. And so it's kind of like the closest thing we can get to actually like spying on our molecules and like what we made. Um, and so whenever you make a crystal, it's a big deal. It's a huge like fun thing to just go and then get to run it and understand what you made, what's inside there. That's great. Yes, it's always been something in our field uh, that people have always felt really excited about was when you grow crystals. Now the technology is such that the hard part is growing the crystals. Once you grow the crystals, it's a little bit easier to get to do all the x-ray analysis. That's all pre-packaged, but growing the crystal now, nah, there's, the, there's the tough part, isn't it? It's quite it's, rewarding yeah. when that happens. Black magic. <laughs> yeah, that's tough. That's tough. Anybody else want to jump in with any of your favorite or most rewarding things to do? Evan um, or Yanai, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I, I was uh, about to say something extremely basic, but you know, we work in the field of both organic and inorganic chemistry. And what brought me at the beginning to this type of science is just the ability of adding two components and observing a sudden change of color or something evolving from the reaction. You know, it's like those childish sentiments that you carry on to the science. So. Every time that I perform a reaction and suddenly something exciting like that happens, I, I feel it's extremely rewarding. You don't have that in any type of, or any line of work, you know? There's a question that just came in. What's the life of a graduate student or postdoc like in terms of how many hours you spend in the lab and working on projects outside the lab each week? I mean, I guess that would be not projects, but other things outside the lab, I guess is the question. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Evan, would you like to weigh in a little bit about life as a grad student postdoc? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, I would say it's, it's kind of nice um, sort of on that work schedule because most of the time your timelines and, and kind of expectation for results are kind of what you and your boss kind of agree on. You're not necessarily on a timeline by a business or anything like that. And so um, I would say like working in a lab is, you know, probably pretty close to full time, maybe a little more, maybe a little less, depending on kind of how long your reactions take and, and that sort of thing and how long it, it takes your data to be collected. Um, and outside of the lab, you know, I'd say um, most any time that kind of goes um, to that is probably like, research, uh, like kind of more of a reading at your own pace kind of thing, if anything. And so um, I'm most mostly pretty reasonable uh, in my experience. And so, uh, but schedules can vary a lot as we had talked about undergraduates, mentoring, your schedule might adjust for that, meetings and all that, so. Yeah, I mean, I think it's pretty intense work. I mean, people get pretty into it. I, I, I know that this group of students and postdocs works really hard. Um, and I think a lot of that is because they love what they do um, and you get wrapped up in it. And sometimes I, I, I know from when I was a graduate student, I would just forget what time of day it was because I would be, get so engaged with something. And then I'd look up and realize, oh, my gosh, I've been doing this for hours and I need to eat or I need to do something. Um, does that ever happen to you? I don't know. It's, it used to happen to me. Um, so I can imagine that's that's a common thing. Um, another question is, does your work ever cross over into the biomedical field? Um, maybe I'll feel that one because, you know, what we do is really fundamental basic research. And so the things that we learn are often relevant to biomedical questions, but the actual work that we do doesn't actually involve biomedicine per se. Um, and I think that's true of basic research in general. Why it's so important is that fundamental research plays a really critical role in laying the groundwork 
for future studies and applications that could end up in all sorts of different arenas of life. Um, and I think that's the driving force behind what we do, but fundamentally what we do is we try to understand in detail what's happening. And ultimately we're hopeful that what we learn will end up being used in other ways. Um, me, another question I'd like to ask is, and this is a specific one for Caitlin and Appy, you know, what was it like to move and set up the lab at WashU? What did you learn from that experience? Yeah, that was such a fun experience. Um, we were able to sit in on meetings where we were going over blueprint plans for the lab. And we were there in the building before any walls even went up. So being able to see that whole process of like, the blueprints to no walls to all the walls going up and then us putting all of our um, lab equipment in there and building it to what our vision was on paper. Um, that was just a really invaluable experience in project managing and, and you know, logistics. Um, yeah. And then in the move, having to learn a lot of the different techniques that we have in our lab. Um, it really gave us the opportunity, all of us the opportunity to learn the ones that we wanted to learn or learn most of them. And then also take on leadership roles because we were starting a brand new lab. Yeah, I'll, I'll second that. It was just really amazing to watch, you know, all of the the glove boxes arrive and the solvent system installation. And so like we understand, you know, what it takes to to set up a glove box and to, to set up a lab of this scale is really unique. Um, and, and to be there for it and understand um, and like be familiar with the vendors and the, the warranties and what to do when when that malfunctions like, oh, that that's from in the beginning when, you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it was a really amazing experience that I'll, I'll, is going to be valuable for me in my next position as a postdoc at Berkeley National Lab and for, for years to come as a, as a researcher. It was, it was incredible. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. So questions are now pouring in. So let me turn to some of them that have come in. Um, one question is how does the, how do we collaborate and interact with labs in the building or elsewhere in WashU in general? Um, Maybe maybe um, we can maybe talk about some of the instrumentation that we use. That's shared instrumentation, and um, um, some of that kind of thing would be useful to talk about. Um, Laura, go ahead. Sure. Um, so as far as shared equipment, um, the um, NMR machines that we use are um, used by the whole department. Um, so is the EPR technically, although I think we might be the only ones that actually use that. Um, and I know there's also um, some people in our group have been using equipment um, that's on the med campus as well. Um, so it's really nice to have that as a resource. Um, as far as um, <clears throat> how we collaborate with other groups, um, we don't have any like specific scientific collaborations going on. But one of the, um, the really nice things about Brian Hall is our lab is right next to um, a lab, the Barnes Group lab, actually. Um, so it is really nice if um, one of our groups might have a chemical the other group doesn't have, we can borrow it or they can borrow it from us. Um, or if you have a question that um, someone in that group might have more expertise on, you can just walk down the hall and be like, hey, do you have a minute? Um, so that is, um, that is really nice. And of course, most of the other labs in the department um, are either in Bryan Hall or um, McMillan, which is attached. So it's pretty easy to find who you wanna find. Yeah, I think that sort of that's that kind of uh, very loose collaboration is is really more most common for us where we when we run into a problem, we can see somebody else just down the hall and get them to help us. Another question is, what advice would you have for AP Chem students and high school students in general who might be interested in science? Is there any advice that you would give high school students about um, about research or getting involved in research or maybe getting it coming to wash you to study chemistry? Anybody want to tackle that? I'll, I'll start. Um, I would say just um, try not to be compelled by like what you think is the most going to be the most like trendy kind of science and focus on the, the problems that are interesting to you because that's where you're going to be able to make the most progress. Uh, like focus on the puzzles that are interesting to you. 
Um, and you'll only know which ones are interesting if you get a lot of experience. So just if you can get into a lab, uh, even just to shadow someone, that's huge. Just so you know what, what it, it is a day in the life. If you want to be in the lab doing like synthetic chemistry like we do, or if you want to do more like computational based problems or, or what have you, um, just the experience of it will be huge and guiding you towards what your, what your field is. That's, that's great advice. Thank you, Abby. Um, another question came in and asked, how many people are allowed in your lab at any given time and what lab safety protocols do you practice? Um, so that's a fairly big question because we practice a lot of lab safety protocols. Um, laboratory safety is of course really important to us, but maybe we can address that in a more general way. Um, I mean, Lara, you would be the right person. You're, 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 one of your roles is as lab safety officer, so. Yes, um, so I guess to address um, the first part of that question, um, for a while, we uh, before people were vaccinated, we did have restrictions on how many people could be in lab, but at the moment, um, we don't anymore. Um, and part of that is also, well, we always wear masks, and another part of that is um, labs are extremely well ventilated. We work with a lot of chemicals, um, so it's probably one of the safest places to be that isn't outside. Um, but as far as um, chemistry-related safety, um, I mean, we have documents upon documents of all the specific procedures that we follow um, to make sure that everyone stays safe in lab. Um, this morning, I tested all the eyewashes. We have five, yes, we have five eyewashes in lab um, and we test them every month. Um, we have specific um, procedures set in place for using stuff like liquid nitrogen that could be really dangerous um, for, for working alone in lab if people are here on the weekend or later at night when there's not a lot of people there. Um, so safety is really um, a the number one priority in lab. I'll also just mention that, that as a research advisor, you know the health and safety of everyone who works in my group is a, is of course paramount, and that's um, something that uh, we we always take very seriously. In fact, before every time we meet as a group to, to talk science, we have a we take a moment to talk about some safety issue. Um, we call it a safety moment. And that discussion um, is often longer than I kind of want it to be sometimes because we get engaged in all sorts of debates about what's the safest way to do X or Y. And I think um, those discussions are actually really helpful in making sure that everyone understands the significance of safety um, and being safe in the lab uh, at all times. So we, we take safety quite, quite seriously. Um, maybe another question I could ask is how does the specific lab in Bryan Hall help you? In other words, how does this newly renovated Bryan Hall laboratory impact your professional and per personal experience? Um, um, I don't know, maybe maybe uh, Evan or Yanai, you could talk about that. Maybe Yanai, because you've, you, you've experienced somewhat different laboratory environment when you were in Israel. And right, right. So uh, yeah, in Israel, I worked both at the University of Tel Aviv University at, and another um, uh, engineering college. And I can tell you that the level of the labs over there wasn't um, even close to what I'm experiencing right now. And you know, the, the impact of that is that everything you want to do um, is more efficient, it's faster. You don't waste time on looking for you know all kinds of equipment parts that have been forgotten in a drawer from the 60s. Um, you don't have to constantly fix stuff that uh, is uh, broken and, you know, just being in a, such a, a new environment in the lab that like you saw in the, in the video is seamless. We have such a good interactions between people in the lab if we have to communicate with each other. That's a huge benefit of, you know, doing research the right way. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, when, one person asked a question, is the training different for a graduate student or a postdoc who wants to make a career in academia versus someone who wants to go into industrial uh, laboratories? Um, Evan, maybe you can answer that question because you've sort of, you've seen both now. You're working in industry now and you came from an academic, academic labs and. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it's, it's a really interesting question that you ask because I think um, in an academic realm, for training, you might expect oh, maybe you should have more time mentoring, um, you know, graduate students or uh, undergraduates or working in industry. 
you know, I'm not entirely sure what the better, what, what you would want to do more of for that aspect, but just to kind of loop, loop everything together, I would say uh, working in industry um, from a mentoring perspective, I found a lot of the folks that I work with are, are, for example, technicians or chemical engineers whose knowledge base of synthetic chemistry is about where an undergraduate would be. And so having this mentorship experience is, is really crucial to, to be able to do this type of job. Um, and alternatively, you know, in terms of preparation for an academic job, um, the, the chances of you working on one single project the entire time you're at a company are incredibly slim, right? So you want to kind of broaden your knowledge. But I think from an academic perspective, you want to also broaden your horizons as much as possible from a knowledge base. And so uh, personally, I think that training for each type of position is, is really similar. Um, so. Yeah, I, I would agree. And, and it would add just that we don't actually distinguish that because many people who work in the lab don't even know whether they're going to end up in academia or industry until they've left. I mean, people often uh, will go on to a postdoc because they still don't know whether they want to go into academia or industry and they want to just keep doing science and refining their skills and learning more until they know. And so I, I would say that the training is really identical. Um, it, being a good scientist is being a good scientist and no matter where you do it. And I think that's, uh, I think that would be the, the one lesson. And we only have a few minutes left, but maybe, maybe I can get your feedback, everyone, about you know, if you, you reflect on your time in the lab, what's the most important things you've learned working in our group? Do you have any thoughts about that? What are the most important things you've learned? Um, I can start. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, because I've been reflecting on this. As you said, I've been writing my thesis. Um, and I have always enjoyed writing uh, my whole life. Uh, but learning how to write scientifically, scientific writing, that is a whole nother animal. And you are an incredible writer, an incredible editor, and have like taught me so much about how to frame my science in a, in a scientific writing kind of way. And that's, that has been the, the theme of the year for me, uh, which I, that's I'm going to, yeah, keep with me. Certainly writing skills are something you take with your whole life. And it turns out that no matter what you end up doing after graduate school, uh, you're going to have to write. Uh, so it's, it is a common thing. Other, other comments? Caitlin, do you have something that you'd like to add about, you know, what's the most important thing you think you've learned? Um, yeah, I, I think personally, like my um, connections with everyone has really meant a lot to me. Um, and so I guess just like keeping that, you know, good working relationship with people and like uh, collaborating with people and learning how to do that. Because like Evan said, you know, it's, it's going to be done no matter where you're going and, you know, mentoring, collaborating, like being able to communicate your science to other people. And so I think that's really invaluable and that's what I'll take away. What about others? Laura, you and I, you have other comments you want to add about the most important thing you think you've learned working in the group? Um, I, one of the really great things about our lab is um, just all the different people that come from all different areas um, I know who aren't here. We have um, a graduate student and a postdoc who are both from China. We have another postdoc who's from um, who's from uh, Bangladesh. Um, and also just <laughs> even the rest of us, we all come from different places. We all had different paths here. Um, and that means that there's a ton to learn from every single person in the lab. And also, um, I guess no matter what career path we go with, we're going to have to work with people who um, have very different views, um, very different ideas, very different mindsets from what we have. Um, so working in an environment um, like that will definitely prepare all of us for our future workplaces. That's terrific, Laura, and I would agree totally. I think that's something I've always try to do in hiring, bringing people into my group is to make sure we have a diverse group of people with diverse perspectives and viewpoints. Uh, because ultimately I think the science that we do will be better because of that, because we have conflicting ways of looking at the same thing. And, and that's good. That's a good thing. Um, it's a good thing to have multiple perspectives and solving the most important problems that, that we face. Um, United, do you want to add anything to that? Um... Sure. I mean, um, definitely agree with uh, Lara about, you know, science being international and having international people around you speaking the same language of chemistry was a unique experience and, you know, taught me a lot. 
and also the resources that we have here, which are indispensable. You know, the being part of the CSP, the Center for um, Sustainable Polymers. You know, um, allowing me to establish those collaborations with other people, um, gain uh, from their uh, unique expertise. You know, that's something that I, I don't think I was. I would be able to to gain from another um, working environment. So I'm really grateful for all of that. So maybe one one more quick question. Um, someone posted this question. Can can any of you tell us about a specific eureka moment you had in the lab and, and what that felt like? I'll try. <laughs> I mean. It's hard to, to point your finger on something specific, but I will say is that one of the best feelings, um, you know, in doing science is when something succeeds because of a hundred things that you're trying to, to do or to make, um, maybe a handful will actually work, you know? And uh, I, at the moment uh, in my uh, previous project where you know, uh, I was working on a, me a mechanism of a catalyst, how it operates exactly. And I find I, I found a new pathway that they can uh, do the polymerization reaction through. And for me, it was, wow, okay. In, in other papers that I've been reading all along, they, they didn't mention that it was seemed impossible. And suddenly I was able to show that under the right conditions, it actually works and, and publish it and add to the uh, you know, scientific community, um, the, poly the polymer scientific community. So for me, it was like a great achievement. Yeah, that's, 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 th there are fun moments, but you're right. Sometimes they're not single moments. They're sort of enveloping things that happen over time. They're not necessarily a single moment. Um, we're, we're actually running out of time, so um, I have to close things out. Um, thank you all uh, for being here. We reached the end of our time, so I want to thank you all for joining us and for your interest in research at Washington University and for celebrating the power of arts and sciences with us this year. As Dean Hu mentioned in his welcome, the new strategic plan for arts and sciences was just made public, and we'd like to end by sharing a video that celebrates the new vision for arts and sciences at Washington University. A link to the strategic plan website is also in the chat. So thank you again for your time and attention and enjoy the rest of your day. Our campus sits near the confluence of two ancient rivers. Ecosystems merge and thrive in our midst. Our region has seen diverse cultures take root fight for survival, and reach toward greatness. A host of resources, historical and cultural, innovative and intellectual, enrich our work. They draw us to engage with our city, with each other, and with communities around the globe. Our school, Arts and Sciences, represents a convergence of ideas ideas that shape our understanding of the world and indeed the world itself. We will elevate scholarship that is creative and ambitious by embracing new ideas, emerging technologies, and shifting paradigms. We will honor and promote the pursuit and discovery of knowledge. We will seek distinction in cutting edge scholarship and push boundaries both within and among disciplines to meet the most critical challenges facing our communities and our planet. We will find new ways to tell our story, to share the matter and meaning behind our work. We are an institution devoted to bringing people together to serve the public good. Our partnerships here in St. Louis and across the region will identify shared goals and we will pursue academic and educational excellence that positively impacts our communities. We will forge critical connections from the local to the global, expanding solutions and imparting lasting impacts on the world within our own community. Faculty, staff, and students of all identities will feel valued, represented, and equally empowered 
to pursue their goals. Here, we will create meaningful connections with our peers, our mentors, and the St. Louis community. We will gather knowledge and learn how to apply it to build lives filled with meaning and purpose. We will go out into the world as engaged, active, 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 active and impactful members of our communities. Together, our voices will rise to shape the next decade and all the decades to come. We are ready. The time is now. Welcome to the Decade of Arts and Sciences. <laughs>